Welcome to the Keith B. Dixon Zone on Periscope. Dropping photography knowledge all day long. Right? Right? Hey, hey, hey. Welcome back. Welcome back. Although that intro is the original intro, I still love it. Yes, I don't even, I'm having a hard time changing it. Welcome to the Kilo Bravo Delta Zone, the Keith B. Dixon Podcast Zone, you guys. It's been a while since I've actually recorded a podcast. Part of the reason, because I do miss you guys, part of the reason I just had a lot of life changes, like literally. Where do I start? Oh my God. 40 Five pounds. I've lost 45 pounds, you guys. 45 pounds. And I, and I got to tell you, it was difficult. It wasn't physically difficult. It was more mentally difficult. And right after I finished speaking, I think in New Orleans, I literally stepped back. And um, before New Orleans, I had spoke in Raleigh, North Carolina at the High Five. And one of the Topics like I spoke on high five is a big deal. It's put on by the American Marketing Association. And my topic while I was speaking was mindset reset. And I chronicled my life as I reset along the way. My whole lifespan, 52 years. I'll be 53 tomorrow. My whole 52 years. Um, I was I was 52 when I was speaking I chronicled it and all the changes and I talked about how difficult it was and um, doing it and why you should reset, why you should step back sometimes and look at what you're doing so you can smell the roses and breathe the coffee or whatever, however you want to, you put that. And you know what? For the first time in my life, I actually drank the Kool-Aid. I was like, let me step back. So now I'm single, right? 21 years of marriage. Now I'm single. Big life adjustment, not only emotionally, but financially. So that was the first big change. And I got to tell you, when life hits you like that, it's hard to focus on the transition and what you need to be doing. Something's going to suffer. The one thing I didn't want to suffer with is my mental health, because emotionally you go through a lot of changes when you're going through any type of separation. Or, or grieving process. So that was number one. Number two was I had gained so much weight. And if you know me from uh, way back in the day, I'm on my way back, maybe 30, 40 years, you guys know I was an exercise beast. I mean, I had got down to like 10% body fat. That was incredible discipline to do that. And, um, you know, I figured out that my happiness really revolved around how I looked and felt. It does. It really does. It has nothing to do with anybody else but yourself. So you know what? I started out on this journey and I basically a weight loss journey. It started back in 2017. And I got to tell you, it was it has definitely been one of the most difficult things. It's more difficult now because when you get older, it's a little harder. You're setting your ways. You're doing things. But I got to tell you, I put my mind to it first, not the physical, not the exercise. I put my mind to it. And I got to tell you, the one thing that really triggered me up, I went to the doctor and I was really paranoid about it because when you're overweight, a lot of things are out of balance. And I. I got to tell you, he said something that just really set me on fire. And he said, Keith, you got to think about your health like you do your job. You have to do you have to do and treat and maintenance your health like you would a job. And that did it all for me. It it did. It it set me off. It set me on fire. I joined Weight Watchers, got on their point system and literally just the way just started pouring off. I wasn't even exercising, guys, to be honest with you. When you saw that video on Instagram, and I have two Instagrams, by the way. The video on Instagram is literally um, just months of just doing that same pattern, that same thing day in and day out, and finally getting to the point where I felt like, you know what, I could sprint up this hill. Not a fast walk, not some medium jog, but I'm going to sprint up that hill. That took months. So I want you to know that no success by design is going to happen quickly. You might achieve some, but it won't last. So since 2017. So going forward, I felt like mentally I just was not in the space to really get on this platform and share and do the things that I needed to do because I was trying to fix myself. 
And I think that's important, especially if you are a business owner, an entrepreneur, or innovator, whatever your case is, you have to constantly maintenance yourself. And, and that's what's key. Because when you go, 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 sometimes you just, you miss everything. It's like being on an airplane and you're, you're passing over a state, which would, in a car, think about this. Think about this analogy. If you're driving across the state of Wyoming, right, it might take you 12, 14 hours. In an airplane, it might take you 45 minutes. And in the airplane, you're not going to see anything but what's above. And you're not going to be able to see it clearly. In the car, you're going to see all the little details. Yeah, you'll still miss stuff. But guess what? You'll see more than you would in an airplane. So that's how life, life has a funny way of showing itself. So that's, in a nutshell, what I wanted to talk to you about um, going forward and in, in introducing my podcast, which will come out every Friday and I'm going to definitely try to get it out before 5 p.m. So I'll be crazy editing. And if you're watching me on Facebook Live right now, um, my apologies for not responding to your comments right away because we're recording this live. Yes. So today we're going to talk about the business of photography. I'm going to introduce five topics that you should think you should think about marinate on. And one of the things that I love about podcasts is you can you know what I like to say we own it. You know, everybody's a lot of the majors, major companies and organizations are shifting towards podcast. And I, I could just I could it's it's funny. You hear people um, talking about and now you can listen to us on our podcast. I mean, just major companies that you would never have thought would have been in a position to do a podcast or even consider it. Now they're doing it. And here's why I believe they are. We own it. We own this platform. It's not like Instagram or Facebook or any of these other platforms where you're confined and contained and you, people have to be signed on and logged in to see it. Not so much with podcasts. So you, you can create an audio file, just upload it to your website if you want to. You don't have to, um, you know, host any video or any that kind of stuff. It's just a lot simpler. And here's the part that I love the most. You can download it. Anytime you feel like if you you can stream it, right? You don't even have to download it. You can stream it. But if you want to download it and archive it and save it to your phone, you can do that with all these other platforms. And that's what I love about it. That's, you know me, I'm chasing freedom, not platforms. I'm not chasing popularity. I'm chasing freedom, you guys. So we're going to talk about the business of photography. And my very first point that I want to talk about, because I've been at this for 23 years. I've been self-employed for 23 years. I got a great house. I got a great life at this point. And I'm feeling good. So you know what? I'm going to share some of my tips and tricks and things. It hasn't always been rosy. So a lot of these tips are based on that. Hasn't always definitely hasn't been easy. So I want to share these things with you guys. And the first thing I want to talk about is because I get asked this question all the time from people. How do I get started? How do I find clients? Who's the ideal client? What does that look like? Well, you know what it looks like? I'm going to tell you right now. It looks like a racehorse. Your client looks like a racehorse because that's what you need. Let me let me tell you what a racehorse really is. A racehorse is a client that has set some goals, has some expectations, and they're looking for people who can get on with them and support that. Now, if they're growing as a business, you are going to grow with them. You're going to experience growing pains because you're going to start out doing a little bit of work. And as you guys get more and more ingrained, guess what's going to happen? You're going to be growing with them and experiencing those same pains. Matter of fact, ideally, if you can get one or two great clients that can support you, and I'll talk about that, you're going to make a ton of money in terms of surviving. And that's what I want to tell you. So you want to survive and then you want to thrive because if you're always surviving, you're just going to be broke. But in the beginning, you got to survive. And that's the key. You got to focus on that. So what does a racehorse actually look like? A racehorse is a client. And I'll give you a good story. Uh, I have a client right now. I started with her. She's a real estate agent. And um, we do a pod. We're actually doing a podcast together right now. So 
um, Real Estate For Real. You guys should definitely check it out. I'm the co-host on there and I'm actually the lay person, the person that is not the real estate expert that's asking the consumer related questions. We've grown from looking at uh, from doing it, literally, I'm not, in, I'm not even embarrassed to tell you this. I was doing $50 photo shoots, 50, I call them drive bys. They weren't photo shoots, but when we first started together 13 years ago, I got paid $50 to drive by, take the front, um, take a picture of the front of the house. And maybe if they if it looked good in the back, the back and I was out, it literally took me 15 minutes and I'd make 50 bucks and she would send me all of these listings and I'd go by there and that was my day. I didn't really care because I looked at, if I did three of those, it was 150 bucks. That was gas money. Uh, you know, maybe a PG and E bill, a, a, an energy bill. We, we call it PG and E in California, a PG and E bill, a telephone bill. That's literally how I looked at it. Every dollar made sense to me when I was first starting out, especially in interior photography and especially as it related to real estate, working with real estate agents, because they don't really change once they get their claws in on a particular vendor or service. And that's what makes it hard. So, that I started to escalate. And I'm going to tell you right now, I am probably one of the highest priced interior photographers for, for a residential in the Bay Area right now. I kid you not. So it goes from that to, you know, 10 times what I was making, but it took 13 years. And it took 13 years of being in a relationship with a real estate agent who was basically a racehorse. Not only did I get the photography, but I got the video and some of the marketing in terms of how that agent functions. So that relationship has grown from, you know, let's say a thousand dollar, twelve hundred dollar a year to double digits per year. But it took 13 years, you guys. And, and that's the thing that I want to tell new photographers, you know, when they get into the photography game, it doesn't happen overnight. Sometimes people are watching, sometimes you're growing together with them, but that is the racehorse mentality. So um, definitely, <laughs> definitely, if you have questions on, on, on those topics, on, on, on those, on that experience, share them with me, share them with me. If you're watching on Facebook live, share them with me. So let me go to my, my second point, pricing. I get that so much. What do I charge? What do I charge? What do I charge? Well, I'm going to tell you when you ask that question, it's really a kind of like a rhetorical question in a sense. I don't think anyone can really tell you what to charge, especially for what we do, because the, the value is kind of like intrinsic. You know, what we do is intrinsic. That means it's subjective. You know, it's it's what we believe it is. It's, you know, it's our experience. It's our skill set. It's, it's how we feel that creates that intrinsic value. It's like a dollar. We believe that a hundred dollar bill is different than a dollar bill because of what's printed on it. I mean, think about how powerful that is. Well, people that that's our, our thinking as human beings, you know, what are we putting on our work? Are we putting, you know, bad lighting on our photography? Are we putting great composition on our photography? Are we marketing really well? Because some photographers, you know, their work isn't as good as some of the best selling, but they're making more money. Those are those are realities. The thing that I want to say about pricing is you have to price for the right opportunity. Once you understand the opportunity, then you can price. And sometimes if the opportunity is the low hanging fruit, guess what? You're going to price for the low hanging fruit. You know, I would have never expected that $50 would turn into 10 times the return. I just never expected that. But you know what? I priced it according to the opportunity and that opportunity was what that agent was willing to pay. Now, I can't get into what they should pay. I can only get into what they're willing to pay. And when I think about pricing opportunity, I think about can they pay that for the next two or three years? Because I'm looking at each client as a way to um, earn extra income outside, you guys, outside of something I call the one-offs, you know, the one-offs. So I'm going to talk about that in my next point, 
the one-offs. You guys, there. You know what a one-off is? Let me let me fast track. A one-off is a wedding photographer who sets up a booth at a wedding fair and then attracts clients one at a time. You'll never really see those clients again. And if you do get a referral from them, it'll be years down the line, possibly, because they know somebody that's getting married. But there's no guarantee that you're going to actually get that business because they got to like you and your work. So what you what you find yourself doing is scrambling and competing for all the one off business with everybody else. And then it comes down to your marketing and how great you present yourself, what you look like and all. There's a lot of variables there. I'm going to tell you, man, it's like digging into a barrel and then you got to pick up and touch every single marble inside the barrel to make sure that it's perfect. Who wants to do that? I don't want to compete like that. I don't. But some people do and they do it very well. So um, you have to know that although most people fit into the curve, there are people who are doing very well that are in what we call the outlier, right? It's outside the statistical curve. So when you're pricing for opportunity, you got to think about your client. The more you know about what they want and what they believe, I'm going to tell you the better your price. Now, I will tell you this because I got to I got to keep this structured a little bit so it's not like the wild, wild west. And the thing that I want to tell you is pricing should always be based on your cost. And I always factor in my pay period always matter of fact that's one of the first things i'm gonna make 45 50 bucks an hour 100 dollars an hour whatever that is that's i'm gonna i'm paying myself first and then i'm factoring in all the other costs and you don't have to always people line item things you know we we learn to do it that way i'm gonna tell you for me that sucks like I don't do line items. I just put it all together and um, I do line items that for me, but I don't do it for the client. And in some cases you do have to, if you're working in a production, you have to line item things. But as a, a commercial photographer, generally I don't, I just line item the things that I'm going to do. I don't associate costs with it because clients can beat you up on that all day. Well, I'm charging you for travel. Well, I like to travel on United. What if the client likes to travel on Southwest and Southwest is $100 less? Now I got to travel on Southwest. So I just put in an airline ticket and average the cost if there's a big difference like that, if it is $100 less and just average that cost out. And then most of the time, the clients don't say anything. So that's what I do for me. And it's worked for 23 years. I've been at this for 23 years, you guys. So let's go into that. That's my spin on pricing. Let's talk about living off your, I like to say living off your clients. And remember just earlier, just I I talked about one-offs. If you have a client and they can't sustain you in photography, you're probably not going to make it very far. Now, look, this is my opinion. It's based on 23 years of being an entrepreneur. That's just 23 years as a photographer. I've actually been out here a lot longer than that doing other businesses. I've been self-employed my whole life. I'm going to be 53 tomorrow. Tomorrow's my birthday. Yes. So if you want to throw me some happy birthday wishes, great. I love them. Right. I'll definitely uh, log on to see that. But yeah, my birthday is tomorrow. So I've been self-employed a majority of my life. And I got to tell you, um, at this point, I don't think I really know how to do anything else but be self-employed because it, it, it is very difficult. It is extremely difficult, but it is extremely rewarding when you know that everything you've created is because you've actually created it. You can't point the finger at somebody else. You can't blame anybody else. And the thing that I love about it the most, you guys, the thing that I love about it the most is it forces you into this self-responsibility thing. It becomes, um, it, it blends into your personal life. So let me pause right here. And um, <laughs> and right now we've just covered uh, the racehorse. That was the, the very first topic and uh, pricing for the right opportunity. And we're going into living off your clients and one-offs. So um, living off your clients. So if you get a racehorse, 
hopefully it turns into a client that can sustain you. And it doesn't mean that you're going to jack that client up for, for everything that, that you need. They're going to become one of 10, I like to say, one of 10 clients who sustain you. They give you money all throughout the year some in some form or fashion as a photographer. And when you get those 10 clients, what you do is you start to maintain them and maintenance them and prioritize them based on a lot of different factors because that's what's going to keep revenue coming through your door on a regular basis. Forget all that other stuff about marketing and all that. Look, I'm going to tell you right now, you guys, I've done a lot in social media. I've written articles. I've spoke in front of 800 people in Nashville. That was just last year. Uh, I've done millions of impressions. I was doing 5 million impressions on Twitter every 28 days. Like I've done it all. Nothing. None of that compares to the book of clients I've developed through personal relationship. None of it. Matter of fact, I've made more money through personal contacts and relationships and, and my 10 clients, my 10 top clients, because it used to be way more and I cut some back and cut people, you know, as a photographer, you can fire clients too. Nothing compares to those clients. Nothing. None of that stuff that I've done in social media has ever brought me the return that I've gotten from the personal relationships that I've developed in my business. Matter of fact, I know a lot of photographers right now who have no marketing, no social media. They, they have a page up, a web page up, um, and they have, you know, Facebook and all that kind of stuff, but that's not where they spend their time. They spend their time going to lunch with their clients, following up with them, networking events and things like that. They don't do social media. Social media is an additive. It's, a resume builder. That's what social media is. It's a way for your clients to get on and vet you out. When you make it more than that, when you depend on social media more than that, guess what? The mistakes start to happen. The diversions start to happen. You start diluting. Yes, I said it. I did. And I want you to know the importance of social media is really to accent. So when you're making a living off your client base, it's mostly through personal relationships and avoiding one offs. The one thing that I assess from a client right out the gate is our ability to work together going forward. Can they rely on my product to represent their business? If I'm doing an, an interior photo and I, I'll give you a good example. There was this one agent. I, we hadn't worked together a lot. There's one real estate agent. We hadn't worked together a lot. And she caught this, this million dollar listing. And she says, Keith, I, I need you to shoot the photos. And I gave her the price and she didn't budge. When I saw her on site, she says, well, you know, this other company that I use, they, this is what they charge. And I was like, why didn't you go with them? And she says, because I need the best representation of this property. Let me repeat that. I need the best representation of this property. The budget warrants the best. Now, look. You're probably thinking you should always use the best, but what if the money's not there? What if the opportunity, remember what I said about the opportunity? What if the opportunity isn't there to really bring in the best? What are you going to do? Spend the money and take a loss? You got to get, you have to match up opportunities and that's really the key, you guys. That's really the key. You have to match up opportunities. So um, can I make a living off this client? No. We, we're not doing that much business together, but she was willing to pay the market or the asking price. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. Is there a potential for more business? We actually talked about that. What is my potential to get more business? And the first thing she said was, you know what? I'm going to have you come in and speak to my office. And you know what? Bing, 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 bing. The lights went off because most real estate offices, they're trying to charge vendors to come in and speak. They look at their realtors as assets. And in order to utilize those assets, you as a vendor have to pay for them. I don't necessarily agree with that, but I see their point. So to get in front of a group of realtors is very difficult. It is. It really is. And realtors are looking at ways. And I don't know if you guys know this, but a lot of real estate offices make money off of the number of real estate agents in their office. 
you know, paying office fees and all of that kind of stuff. So that's how they make money. So, of course, if you're going to get in front of them, they're going to charge you for it or try to. I know Keller Williams does it. I know for a fact because I've been in this industry for a long time. Well, the fact that I can get in front of an agent is important to me because all I need is one. Because remember, there's 10. I got 10 already. I just need one, one in the pipeline, that one agent who's going to be a racehorse for me, somebody I can grow with. I might even give them an introductory price so that I can help them to develop their business if I know they're going to do something. And how do you know that? Well, to be honest with you, it's all instinct. Um, it's asking the right questions. It's, you know, having been out here for tw at least tw I'm going to tell you, I've been out here for about 30 years self-employed. I was self. Matter of fact, I got through college hustling computer repairs. So I've been out here a long time like this. There's just things that you know. There's things that you know about people when you meet them. Um, I could ask, and, and I'm going on a little bit of a sidebar because we're talking about live, how do you live off a client? How do you make that determination? I can look at a photographer and ask two or three questions and know whether or not they're going to survive. Do you have kids? Do you have a family? Are you married? Right? And some photographers look at me like, why does that matter? Because... It does. Photography is is a solo sport. Is <laughs> uh, George Deloach used to say, um, it's a jealous mistress, right? If you're married, photography is a jealous mistress. He used to tell me that all the time. You have to give it your fullest attention all the time. That's for anything that you're going to do as an entrepreneur. This is being in a let's take photographer out and put in something else right being an entrepreneur a business owner is difficult the reward is great the risk is high the work is long that's what you have to face so finding a client that you can live off of narrows down all those circumstances because now you can focus on servicing that client and that's why i said 10 10 is still a lot to manage but I have clients that I've been working with for 10 years, one for 13. When I say that, I don't say that lightly and I don't say that because it's trendy or fluffy. That's the truth. You know, you have to find clients that you can um, basically, and I like to say live off because it gets your attention, right? Can I live off that client? Matter of fact, that's the buzzword. When you're out and you're meeting somebody, the one thing that I want you to ask yourself is, can I live off this client? Can I make a living off of this client? Can I pull out 20 grand? Now multiply 20 grand times 10. I don't want you to marinate on that one. 20 grand times 10. It, matter of fact, let's just do, let's do uh, 15 grand times 10. Let's go to, uh, let's go to my next point. This is my fourth point, And then we're going to get up out of here because time is money. And I'm going to not keep you on here longer than my goal is usually like 30 minutes, 45 minutes tops because I just want to, you know, they call me the hit man, hit you and, and get on up out of here. All right. So, you know, this is something that I've struggled with because um, this next topic, scaling your business, I've struggled with that. Not in a, not in a way that I, I didn't know how to scale, but what does scaling really mean? And I'm going to tell you, that's going to depend on you. How much do you really want to grow your business? And the thing that I like to say is how much you really want to be in debt. <laughs> That's what scaling means to me. When you scale, you, you're going to accumulate a certain level of debt. And that debt is going to dictate how you move. It's for real. So if you open up a brick and mortar and that brick and mortar is and I'm in California in Northern California. Everything here is expensive. Matter of fact, I live in a neighborhood right now where a two bedroom, we call them condos or two bedroom apartments. If you're in New York, a two bedroom apartment here, good size is going to cost you upwards of four to five thousand dollars a month right now. You can only imagine what a brick and mortar is going to hit you for per month. Like they're not, you can't, in my neighborhood, you can't touch a brick and mortar for less than six grand. 
And if anything less than that, it's just not going to be functional. It's not going to give you, you know, that high dollar feel. It's going to cost you some money. So if that's the case, you're going to have to generate business to feed that. And that's what I mean by um, debt, right? So you're going to take on the debt of running that studio. Our utility bills are very expensive. So you figure for my house here, it's almost close to $200 a month. And, and that's just, I live in a two bedroom, so two bedroom condo, and I'm still paying 200 for the utility. You take, you tack on insurance. Next thing you know, you're about seven grand in the hole every month, unless you're making that money. And a lot of people say, you know what? I'm going to shoot a wedding for five grand, another wedding for five, that's 10 grand. And then allocate that cost to the, um, to the business. All that means is you've You've brought in 10 grand and now you got to start to allocate. So you're going to allocate to the rent. You're going to allocate to this. You're going to allocate to that. Next thing you know, you can't even pay yourself and you're struggling. You're living off a credit card. You're living off the business, whatever you do. It's uncomfortable. So the thing that I want to tell you is if you scale your business, you better be real sure that you can drive enough revenue to not only cover that cost, but cover that cost and pay yourself. Now, the thing that we often don't think about is our health insurance, our vision, and our dental. Health insurance right now, I just got a quote, 800. Because remember, I told you I'm going through this whole, you know, separation and divorce thing. $800 a month for Kaiser. Now, luckily for me, um, one of my exes was in the military. I was married to a, a military woman at one point. She was a captain. And... Um, I caught some good in, some good auto insurance that was able to provide me with some dental and some health or dental and vision for a very reasonable cost. So when you're scaling your business and you're going to brick and mortar route, the thing that I'm going to tell you is you have to consider all of those possibilities. Now, cost in different parts of the country are different. How different? Maybe if I was in Ohio or in, in the belt somewhere Having a studio would make sense, I think, for me, because traditionally people take photos. There, there's a consumer market for that. I know because one of the top grossing studios in the country is actually in Omaha, Nebraska. So um, one of the top grossing studios. So I know that, you know, that that scaling makes sense there. But in California, if you're going to scale I'm going to tell you, you better have some access and a book, a book. You know what I mean by a book, a book of clients. You better have a book of clients that can sustain you and feed you because if you don't, you're going to go under or you're going to be starving. You're going to be living from check to check, client check to check. Now, you guys know I used to have a studio over in Hayward and um, for 20 years I did. I had a studio in Hayward for 20 years and while I was married financially, it just made sense. I could sustain it whether I made money or not. But once that once my income got cut down to one income, guess what? It's not sustainable anymore. And you know what the challenge was? The challenge wasn't sustaining it. I mean, I, I'm smart enough to go out and, and hustle, you know, to make that happen. You know what the challenge was? Really? You guys? It just didn't make sense from a cost standpoint, an emotional cost standpoint an emotional cost standpoint because now I've got my whole house to myself. My kids are all grown. Um, why would I hang on to it? And letting go emotionally was harder than actually making the financial decision because I'd been there 20 years. It was a storefront. It was, you know, a place that I could say, Hey, come, you know, come by, let's do these portraits or whatever. But when I talked to my bookkeeper, my bookkeeper was like, hmm, I don't really see a lot of revenue coming through that, that studio, Keith. I don't know that it makes sense in the profile. And you know what I said? You're right. It doesn't. I'm emotionally attached to it and I don't want to let it go. Matter of fact, when my lease came up, I went month to month and the owner didn't want me to leave. I, and I didn't want to leave either. That made it even harder. So he's like, I'll, you know, let's just go month to month, Keith, and see what happens. So I went month to month for about three or four months, and I realized it just didn't make sense. I'm going to tell you, here's, and I'm going to move on to my last point. I'm going to tell you, scale your revenue. That's a lot better. 
scale, figure out ways to scale your revenue. If you got 10 great clients, you got a race, you got 10 racehorses, you guys, and you're pricing for opportunity, it's working out, you're able to live off of those 10 clients, and the next move is to scale your revenue. And that's what I've done. When when you think about survival and you think about like how did Keith how does Keith survive? Well, I've got 10 clients that I picked for me and they're scaling and I'm moving right with them. So as their business is going up, so is mine. Literally. That is really the key. Is it hard work? It is absolute hard work to find clients like that. But that's what you have to focus on. And it's not going to be online. Yeah. One of my biggest clients, it did happen online. Right. But I'm going to tell you it happening online was more of a vetting process and it was more of like a trophy process. Like, OK, we see him on. He's consistent. He's doing this. He's doing that. OK, we're convinced that. OK, let's bring him in. And I got a little tiny job. That's how I got my biggest clients. They all started with little tiny jobs because people want you to prove it to them. Prove it. Right. So, yeah, everything looks great, but prove it now. So that's what scaling means for me. And the message I want you to take home is scale your revenue. Figure out how to do that. Cut cost and scale your revenue. And if you can't find any way to scale, start cutting, slashing at the bottom. You know, I remember doing um, door dashes at the office. Literally. So when I get the when I got my statement back, my credit card statement back, you know, there's three, four hundred dollars in in. DoorDash. DoorDash is ordering food and having it delivered to the office. Cut that stuff out and watch your bottom line scale. All right, here's my last point. The state of photography. Where's photography going? Where is it going? Now look, never once have I ever felt threatened by an iPhone or, you know, some new technology that's making it easier for people to make photographs. I don't care about that. It doesn't matter. Right. Matter of fact, the, the, the more they do that, the easier it gets for me to do my job because I can use that technology and cut back on buying gear that supposedly gives me a better professional edge. So that's how I see it. Right now, with that said, what are my concerns? You know what my concerns are? That technology and consumer behavior. What does that mean? Instead, here's what it means. And and this sort of scares me a little bit. If I was a video person, I'd be petrified right now because everybody with a phone, a great phone, can just put it up and just record. Matter of fact, companies are smart. Don't get me wrong. They do hire professional video crews. But keyword, they hire professional video crews, which means you got to go in and bid for that job. Right. So if you're just starting out, I'm going to tell you that going into the running with bidding those professional jobs is going to be a little challenging. Now, if they don't put it out for a bid, they're just throwing up their phone and they're probably capturing some really good organic keyword, organic footage, which works on all of these platforms because it doesn't look so produced. That's scary. Now, watch this. I have an iPhone 10, the latest one, whatever it is. And you know what? When I shoot the interiors, I also do the video. And what I do is I get a gimbal. I put my phone on there and record it. And that 4K, if I'm shooting it in 4K, the the low resolution 4K, I want to make sure I say that, right? The low resolution 4K is 10 times better than the 720 um, on my screen. Because, you know, it's not going to show in 4K online, right? It's going to show in 720. Either way, it's really good, right? And it's easy because all I do is when I get to my computer, I just select the video, transfer it over, drop it in a premiere, do the edit, send it out to the client. They look at it. I make the adjustments and I'm done. Back in the day, you had to go in and basically convert the footage and do all of this stuff. That's why I love the new technology 
that they're putting out that's making it so easy because I can capitalize on it. I understand it. And that's where I feel the state of photography is going. So if you're not taking advantage of video as a photographer, if you're not offering that to your clients, because remember, you want to get you a racehorse. You want to price according to the opportunity that's there. You want to live off of that client and you want to scale. And at the end of the day, we are all photographers. Whether you shoot video or not, you are a photographer. And if you don't believe that, the thing that I want to tell you is look at how news agencies refer to their video people. They call them photographers because that's what we do. So video is getting higher performance than anything that's static. But we need static. So the state of photography is start mixing the two. Start figuring out how you can incorporate video into what you do. All right, that's my state of photography. My next episode, 20, number 27, will be out next Friday. We'll be right back here again doing this, doing the deed here. And uh, if you're watching me on a live stream, thank you. You can find my podcast at podcast.keithbdixon.online. That's where I live with this. I'll be having guests on. And uh, you guys, I got to tell you, it's going to be really good. I, I feel really good about this. Matter of fact, I haven't felt this good about doing any social media content since um, the beginning of live stream. That's how good I feel about podcasting. So uh, you can find me on Twitter at Keith B. Dixon. Definitely check out my Instagram. There's two Instagrams and my daughter gave me some ideals on that. Um, one is more personalized. You know, I wanted to, I've always wanted to have a personal Instagram or some personal page. And in the past, I've kind of mixed them in, but uh, I don't think I'm going to do that this time. So Instagram has made it easy to, to operate too. So one is more personal. I am going to share my weight loss experience because I think it's very inspirational. And I think as an entrepreneur, our health is, is important. There's no sick days. There's, in, in a lot of cases, there may not be anybody to cover for you. You have to stay as healthy as possible. And I want to promote that. So as an entrepreneur, as a business person, you have to stay healthy. My name is Keith B. Dixon, commercial photographer all day, every day. This is how we do it in the Kilo Bravo Delta Zone. I will be seeing you later. Peace. Peace.